um, I'm preaching on can women be pastors today, and in two weeks he'll preach on can men be pastors. <laughs> just, just kidding. Why not, right? Turn the tables. So this is a bit of a different message, but it's been burning in my spirit for a long time. Acts 2, verse 17 and 18. And I'm, I told her off today, he says, are you ready? I said, I feel like one of those wind-up toys, it's just all wound up and you just got to let it go. And so I'm just kind of kind of fire hose you. And um, if you have our church app, the notes are in there or you can write fast. I'm, I'm just going to pour out a whole pile of stuff because I could preach on this for four weeks and still have new material. So I'm just going to keep, I, I'm going to just go for it. Um, Acts 2, verse 17 and 18. This is what I will do in the last days. I will pour out my spirit on everybody, say everybody, and cause your sons and daughters to prophesy, and your young men will see visions, and your old men will experience dreams from God. The Holy Spirit will come upon all, say all, all. my servants, men and women alike, and they will prophesy. Now, the last days started on the day of Pentecost after Jesus went up to heaven On the day of Pentecost, that's the day the Holy Spirit came and filled them. That's when the last days began. But right now, we're in the last of the last days before Jesus comes back to take us to heaven, okay? So this is applicable. And it says it's for, he wants, he's pouring his spirit out on everybody and men and women alike will prophesy, okay? So let's keep going here. Um, Yeah, as I said, men and women. This year... My heart has really, really hurt for women who have a call on their life. I've been doing this for 16 years. I know the hits, and I know the battles, and I know everything else, and I'll share more of that in a minute. But this year has been a very public fight over whether women should be in ministry or not. And in fact, the Southern Baptist Convention, uh, Rick Warren from Saddleback Church, actually went head-to-head with that convention, because he had women pastors, and the whole convention said, no, we are not allowing women. We don't, we're not allowing women. And so I think it's 1,100 churches are having to bow out of of that whole um, association because of this disagreement. And my heart hurts, because half the whole church world is saying women don't have a place in church. And, And women are sitting there with this call of God on their life, and this this knowing that God wants to use them, but they're, they're stuck in this, in this conflict of what do I do with that? You know, my church tells me it's not of God, but, but this stirring inside of me, what do we do with that? Right? And so my heart has been, been, been to preach this. I, I've been wanting to, as I said, this message has been on my heart since the spring. I thought I was going to preach it at She. And as I was prepping for She and in October, the Lord was like, no, this is broader than that. You're going to preach it to the church. And I, I'm, a, I'm a, if you didn't know, I'm a pastor. And, um, <laughs> and in, in many ways, um, I have that, that role of lead pastor. You know, we, we equally pastor, but, you know, I do a lot of what typically a lead pastor does. And so I am a pastor, but, um, Many times you come in and maybe, you know, if you're here, it probably means you have some amount of agreement that it's okay for a woman to be a pastor. You know, now that we have a website and people can see us, people, if you don't like it, you're not going to come. So back in the early days before we had them on website, they'd come and go, you know, (laughs) but there's some amount, but for many of you, it might be, you know, I kind of feel like, you know, I kind of like it, but yet I can't really justify it and I is it okay? Is it not? And you have these mixed feelings. And maybe you feel like, well, it's okay because her husband's on the platform too. You know, like all of these things. And so what I want to do is take you through what the Bible has to say about this, right? Because the Bible is our final authority on everything. And I want to give you, as I said, for this church, we have women in ministry. We have a lot of women in leadership positions. But I want to give you the biblical background so you know that you know why we can do this and that you have the confidence to run with whatever God has put on your life, no matter what your situation. Okay? So 
um, Ephesians 4, verse 11 and 12. Now, these are the gifts Christ gave to the church. Who's the church? All of us. The apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, and the pastors and teachers. Their responsibility is to equip God's people to do his work and build up the church, the body of Christ. I find it very interesting. These are what they call the five-fold ministry. So in, in church leadership, you're going to fall into one of these five giftings, so to speak. The interesting thing about this scripture is there is no gender mentioned If you look at this in context, we always have to look at scripture in context. But if you look through that chapter, there is nothing that says, and I give these giftings to men in the church. It doesn't. Now, this is Ephesians 4. If you go to Ephesians 5, it talks about husbands and wives and, and how he wants us to women to honor their husbands and men to love their wives. That's very gender specific. But in chapter 4, it's not. In fact, gender is not even mentioned within this context. So just keep that in mind. Now, Ephesians 3, verse 28. And we no longer see each other in our former state, Jew or non-Jew, rich or poor, male or female, because we're all one through our union with Jesus Christ with no distinction between us. No distinction between us. I'll talk more a little bit about that, but that means there's no ethnic or age barriers. There's no gender barriers. There's no social status barriers. That means no matter what your story is, God wants to use you. No matter what your background is, he wants to use you. No matter what your education is, he wants to use you. No matter what your lack of education is, he wants to use you. Right? There are no barriers. Here he's saying, look, in Christ, we're all in this equal footing where God wants to use us. He wants to pour himself out on you in a mighty, powerful way. Now, I want you to say he's talking about me. Yes, okay? So, my journey as a pastor. If you've been around for a while, you know that I want to share a little bit. Um, I never wanted to speak in front of people until 17 years ago when we started a little home small group called Victorious Living. Uh, and Ralph was like, we're going to do this together. I'm like, no, I don't speak to people. But um, we started doing that, and the thing exploded, and we had like 150 people, and God was moving. And then he called us to start a church. And that calling was so deep inside both of us to do what we're doing right now. As much as it had never been on our plan, we had never wanted to pastor but that call of God was so deep within us, and we started. And it was interesting because I had never seen um, women in ministry. I grew up without ever seeing women in ministry modeled. As an adult, I saw, you know, the odd one here or there, but I didn't really know. I just knew it was a controversial topic. But when we went in, it was the call of God that was so strong that, to me, it was the arguments just didn't matter. And so we started preaching. In the first about four or five years, I was the worship leader as well. So I would lead worship, and we'd um, preach all this. And he was still working, doing real estate, because we own multiple companies. For the first two, three years, he was working pretty much full-time still. And we were actually financially supporting the church by his work. And so in that time, I ended up doing probably 80% of the work of church. And, you know, prepping services, all of the communication, all that kind of stuff. But yet, I was always the pastor's wife. It took probably five, six years before I felt like people were actually seeing me as a pastor. Now, it didn't matter to me because I knew what God called me to do. I don't care what you call me, right? As Ralph would say, just don't call me late for dinner, you know? I... <laughs> I, and then we're fasting, right? So I was like, ah. But um, it didn't matter to me, but I could see this conflict in people where I could preach 80% of a message. Someone would come in and go, oh, my goodness, that was life-changing. Would you tell your husband that he preached the most amazing message ever? And I'm like, 
I go, okay, sure, I will. You know, or when, when your husband shared that story, it all clicked for me. And I'm like, I shared that story. But what I saw is people were having such a hard time seeing me as a pastor that subconsciously they would divert to him to make it comfortable. And that's why we have to doctrinally know why it's okay for me to be on a platform so that we can fully receive, right? And our mind doesn't have to do these subconscious things. But anyhow, so I was a pastor's husband for a long time. And I'm telling you, I I, I operate in a man's world, essentially. I go to conferences and I'm like the female in the room. I I coach for a a company um, as a consultant and I... I'm the only female who coaches these pastors, right? I'm like, are you sure you want me? Because I'm a female. And they're like, yes, yes, yeah. <laughs> but you go to a conference and it's like, okay, lead pastors over here, pastors' wives over there. And I'm like, I'm going with the lead pastors. And they're like, what are you doing over here? You know, <laughs> but, but it's just, it is not an easy. We've had people walk in our doors and screaming loom murder that I have no place being in ministry. We've had to have staff kick them out of the building um, we've had people walk in the doors and go up to him and say, if you don't get that Jezebel off the platform now, you're going down. And uh, people tell us that the church would be triple the size if I wasn't on the platform. Um, yeah, we've had it all. I went through a year, well, a couple of months that were really intense. But over a year, I had people leaving notes in the offering. So don't get any ideas because I'm not even going to read them if you do. <laughs> but um, I learned better. My staff stopped showing them to me. But, um, you know, your heels were too high, your heels were too low, your clothes aren't right, you know, blah, blah, just whatever it is. And, and over and over and over and over for the first five, six years. But you know what? It didn't matter to me because I knew what God had called me to do. And, and, and I knew God had called me, so I don't care what anyone's, I mean, online still. You know, I know after this, it'll flare up again. So just look at the comments and um, of people attacking me and telling me I'm not supposed to be here. Um, funny story is when we were about three years old as a church, uh, he was in Canada. I was preaching by myself. So I led worship and I prepared the message and I preached and did everything. And um, we, my kids used to always joke is that he had to just open in prayer and close in prayer, and he'd get the credit for everything in between. <laughs> and so we kept saying, we got to get him a T-shirt that says the pastor's husband, you know, because I'm always considered the pastor's wife. So anyhow, we, we go and we pre- I preach this whole message, and this visitor was there, and she was a short businesswoman and dressed all really great. And she comes up to me afterwards. She goes, that was amazing. So popular. She says, you know what really blew my mind, though, was that your husband could prepare that whole message, and you just step into it like that. <laughs> I'm like... <laughs> doesn't even have to be here to get the credits. (laughs) But as I said, it really didn't matter to me. I didn't have to defend myself because I knew what the Word of God said about me and I knew what He said to me. So here's the thing is you don't have to defend things when you have the conviction and you have the knowledge and you have the Word of God in your heart and you know what you know. People can attack you. It really doesn't matter. So that's why we want to get the Word of God into us, because my experience really doesn't matter. Um, It depends on what the Word of God is. But I will say this. Uh, I think that, I don't know, this is probably about 12 years ago, 11, 12 years ago, I had been asked to speak at a conference, a women's conference, and I hated women's conferences. I'll just be really honest. But now we do them as she, right? Because we just do them a little, we do them a lot different. But I, I spoke at it. I sat down and this other speaker who was in, beside me, she looked at it. She says, God told me to tell you there's so much more in you than you ever realized. And, and as soon as she said that, the Lord showed me and gave me a vision of a target on my back. And he said, there is a target on your back. I'll walk you through it, but there's a target on your back because you're to pave the way for women to do what I've called them to do. So I've taken more hits than you'll ever know to get to this place. But my hope is that I've taken the hits for the next group of women to rise up without having to take those hits, right? So let's see what God says about this. Okay, God, first of all, God used women powerfully through Scripture. 
They led churches, they led men, they led nations. Um, I think sometimes the Bible names throw us because they're really weird, and we don't know, is that a male, is that a female or not? But they are there. Um, And so I first want to look at Deborah, who was a judge and prophet over Israel. Now, in those days, they didn't have kings, so the judge was the one who was over it all. And this was Deborah. And so I want to look in Judges 4, verse 6 to 9, at a little bit of her story. One day, Deborah sent for Barak, son of, excuse me, these names. If you can come up here and say them, I would love it. But Barak, son of Abinoam, who lived in Kadesh in the land of Naphtali. She said to him, this is what the Lord, the God of Israel, commands you. Call out 10,000 warriors from the tribe of, tribe of Naphtali and Zebulun at Mount Tabor. And I will call out Cesara commander of Jabin's army, along with his chariots and warriors, to the Kishon River. There I will give you victory over him. Barak told her, I will go, but only if you go with me. Very well, she replied. I will go with you, but you will receive no honor in this venture, for the Lord's victory over Caesarea will be at the hands of a woman. So Deborah went with Barak to Kadesh, and they won the victory. So it's interesting. He wouldn't go without her into battle. The Lord had already given that, hey, you're going to go out. He could have gone out. But he says, no, I I can't go without you. So look at this. Barak would not go to war without Deborah, not because he was afraid, but because he understood the powerful anointing on her and knew he needed to be under that covering, even giving a woman credit for the victory. The fact that she was a woman never fazed him because he understood godly covering. Here's a woman at the highest level. She led a whole army. So don't give me this women cannot lead men thing. It's not biblical. We've taken a couple scriptures that we're going to deal with later out of context. But let's look at New Testament. Jesus' resurrection. He died, rose again. He appeared outside of his tomb. Who did he first appear to? Mary. Mary Magdalene. A woman. Now, back in Bible days, um, the, the women's stories or testimonies or whatever else were not included because women could not legally be a witness. They just were not considered witnesses. Only men could be. But he didn't just appear to her. He said, Mary, I'm Jesus. Now go tell the others that I have risen. What did she, he tell her to do, essentially? Go preach to the rest of the disciples. Because preaching is sharing the good news of Jesus. So the first person to preach after Jesus rose was a woman. Don't you think you and I can also preach? Acts 18. It talks about two ministers in the New Testament called Priscilla and Aquila. Now, at the beginning of this chapter... It talks about, um, actually take that scripture down for a sec. Um, At the beginning of the chapter, it talks about Aquila and his wife Priscilla. One time, it puts his name first. Later, though, every other time they're talked about, um, it is Priscilla and Aquila. And in those days, a woman's name would not come first unless she was the dominant or the more, the one with a higher position, okay? So, um, and... Often the argument is, well, women are not supposed to teach men. Women are not supposed to be over men. But here's something interesting, because Priscilla went to correct Apollos. Apollos had been teaching, but he had been teaching in error. And so look what happened. Acts 18, verse 26. And this is referring to Apollos. He fearlessly preached in the synagogue. But when Priscilla and Aquila heard Apollos teaching, they met with him privately and revealed to him the ways of God more completely. In other words... They corrected him, okay? And so there's a lot of examples of powerful women throughout the New Testament, throughout the Old Testament, etc. But here's the question. Are there any woman pastors in the Bible? Yes, there are. But here's something interesting, because I have I hear, I get this argument all the time. Well, you tell me one woman who's named pastor in the Bible. Well, you know what? There's no men called pastor either in the Bible. There aren't. So don't use that argument against me. Because then I could say, well, should men be pastors? I don't see someone called pastor. The word they used was deacon or overseer. 
That's the word they use. They use different terminology. The only place you're going to see pastor is when it, in Ephesians where it talked about the giftings. But um, the interesting thing is in uh, Romans 16.1, it talks about Phoebe. Now, the King James Version, this is where I think it, it kind of went wrong. They call her a servant. But the actual word here is, and I don't have this in the notes, this is a throw-in, diakonos. The original word is diakonos. And do you know what the primary meaning of diakonos is? Minister or deacon. The last meaning of that is servant. Go look it up yourself. And this word diakonos, when referred to Phoebe, they turned it to servant. But when referred to any of the other leaders of the church, they used overseer or deacon. But it's the exact same word. Okay, so just seeing there's some, there's some biases. Um, but God's word can't contradict itself, right? So it affirms itself. So I want to talk about the traditional argument against women in ministry. Um, there's only two places in the New Testament that Paul talks um, where he writes about women being quiet or not leading, being church leaders. And it's in his in his letters to the church of Ephesus and the church of Corinth. So we have to look at context, because I said God's word cannot contradict itself. The Bible always affirms itself. It says, by the, by the witness of two or three witnesses is every word established. So if you're seeing women consistently throughout the Bible in ministry, then how could it say women are not in ministry? There's something we're missing here, right? So you never can take scripture out of context. You always have to put it within context. But both of these cities, Ephesus and Corinth, were um, heavy, heavy, heavy into Diana worship. Okay, it was um, Artemis. Okay, Artemis or Diana worship. And so the, the whole role was weird. And the priestesses in the temples, there was a lot of prostitution within the temple, um, a lot of wrong teaching, etc. Everything was skewed. And we were in Ephesus a few years ago. And it's when you're there and you actually see it, you see how predominantly they put this the goddess Diana. So there was this whole cultural shift that he's trying to handle. So I want to look into these. So because they seem to be contradictions within the word of God, but yet God's word can't contradict itself. So the letter, Paul's letter to the Corinthians church. If you read through 1 Corinthians, what he's doing is he's going over all the policies and the structures of church. This is how you do it. It's kind of like a procedural handbook, right? Going through all of these things. And out of context, you can see um, in 1 Corinthians 14, verse 34, out of context, I want to read it to you of what it says in this instructions, because this church was in total chaos. And so these are his instructions. Verse 34 the women should be respectfully silent during the evaluation of prophecy in the meetings. They are not allowed to interrupt, but are to be a support role, as in fact the law teaches. If they want to inquire about something, let them ask their husbands when they get home, for a woman embarrasses herself when she constantly interrupts the church meeting. If you look at that scripture alone, it's like, yeah, she better be quiet. But as I said, you always, you can never take one scripture and build a doctrine around it, you have to look at it in context of what does the whole, what did the verses before say? What does it say afterwards, right? You look at Judas, it says, and therefore he went and hung himself. Well, that's in scripture. I better take that out of, you know, like you can't take one scripture without looking at the context. So I want to read it through in a different light in context. Now, there's several places throughout these chapters. If you, and I encourage you, go read it for yourself. Go through 1 Corinthians, and in the preceding chapters, what you'll see is Paul seems to be contradicting himself. He'll say one thing, and then he'll say something opposite. And he'll say one thing, and he'll say something opposite. It's like, how could that be? So then, when we put this in context, you'll see the same thing with this issue. But what, ha what scholars believe is that what he was doing was he was responding to a letter from this church asking all, or giving them, giving Paul all of their procedures and their beliefs. And Paul is responding to them with his belief. Now, I don't know about you, but if I get an email with 
15 different items that people want an answer for, what I do is when I respond, I put their question and my response. Anyone else ever do that? Okay. Scholars believe that is what Paul was doing. He's writing their policy and his response. And when you look at the surrounding scriptures, you'll see how that can be true. Let's back up a few verses to verse 31. For you can all, say all, all. prophesy in turn and in an environment where all, say all, all, present can be instructed, encouraged, and strengthened. Keep in mind that the anointing to prophesy doesn't mean that the speaker is out of control. He can wait his turn. For God is the God of harmony, not confusion, as is the pattern in all the churches of God's holy believers. Now we get to that verse 34. The women should be respectfully silent during the evaluation of prophecy in the meetings. Now, doesn't that all, doesn't that just contradict verse 31 that just said, for you can all prophesy? Okay, we have, already have a contradiction. The women should be respectfully silent during the evaluation of prophecy. They are not allowed to interrupt, but are to be in a support role, as in fact the law teaches. If they want to inquire about something, let them ask their husbands when they get home, for a woman embarrasses herself when she constantly interrupts the church meeting. Now here we get into the next contradiction. Verse 36, do you actually think that you were the starting point for the word of God going forth? Were you the only ones it was sent to? I don't think so. If anyone, say anyone. Anyone, how many does that mean? Anyone. It doesn't say if men or women. It says if anyone. If anyone considers himself to be a prophet or a spiritual person, let him discern that what I'm writing to you carries the Lord's authority. And if anyone continues not to recognize this, he should not be recognized. So beloved friends, with all this in mind, be passionate to prophesy and don't forbid anyone from speaking in tongues, doing all things in a beautiful and orderly way. Do you see how if you read this out of context, when you put it into context, it seems to contradict itself unless you look at that 34 and 35 as their thought and Paul's response. Because before that verse, he says, all can prophesy. And after that, he says, all can prophesy. Now, here's a portion that said you've always got to look at the context. Look at the culture. 1 Corinthians 4, 11. So, just a few chapters earlier. Verse 4 to 11. Any man, here it's talking, he says man, any man who leads public worship and prays or prophesies with a shawl hanging down over his head shows disrespect to his head, which is Christ. And if any woman in a place of leadership within the church, oh, Oh, that's interesting. If any woman in a place of leadership within the church, how come he allowed it here and then a few chapters later said you can't? You have to have context. So if any woman in a place of leadership within the church prays or prophesies in public with her long hair disheveled, she shows disrespect to her head, which is her husband, for this would be the same as having her head shaved. If a woman who wants to be in leadership, oh, Wow. If a woman who wants to be in, I, she wants to be, it must be an option. They're not, you're not excited about that. Whoa, whoa. Come on, let's try that. If a woman who wants to be in leadership <laughs> will not conform to the customs of what was proper for women, she might as well cut off her hair. Don't, I'm not going to go cut my hair off, honey. Don't worry about it. But um, verse 11, so then I have to insist that in the Lord neither is woman inferior to man, nor is man inferior to woman. He gives instructions to both men and women for proper conduct within church leadership. How could he, a few chapters later, said women should not speak if he already gave instructions of proper conduct to them? unless that scripture has been taken out of context. Interesting, right? The church of Ephesus, another place where chaos was going. 
The traditional translation looks like this if you don't go back to the original. 1 Timothy 2, verse 11 and 12. Um, 1 Timothy is the instructions to the church of Ephesus. Women should learn quietly and submissively. I do not let women teach men or have authority over them. Let them listen quietly. Once again, this is Paul. He wrote, the same, he wrote to the Corinthians and told them women can be in leadership, and now he's telling them they can't. So there's got to be something we don't know, right? And Deborah was leader over a whole army. How could that be, right? So I want you to look at it. In Bible days, only men were allowed to study in the temples. So the women didn't know the scripture. So they were getting up and disrupting and, and trying to say things that weren't accurate. So he's saying, no, like, we got to get order here, right? They need to learn. But let's look at it from a different perspective, from another translation that actually is, is much more accurate in this. Um, verse 11 and 12. Let the women who are new converts be willing to learn with all submission to their leaders and not speak out of turn. I don't advocate that the newly converted women be the teachers in the church, assuming authority over the men, but to live in peace. You see, you had all these women who were priestesses and learning about Diana with wrong doctrine, trying to speak up in church. Are you getting this? Okay, so they needed to be submissive in this. Now, he's not making a declaration for all time. He's saying for right now, Until they learn the word of God, they need to be quiet, okay? So let's keep going on to another verse that's misunderstood. In that same chapter, verse 13 to 15. For God made Adam first, and afterward he made Eve. And it was not Adam who was deceived by Satan. The woman was deceived, and sin was the result. Here, I get this all the time. Well, yeah, Eve is the one. The Bible says, you know, Eve is the deceived one, so she can't lead. That's not why he said this. You see, in this time period, there was a Gnostic, that's a good word, Gnostic teaching that Eve was first created and Adam came out of Eve. That's not what it's, he's trying to correct one of the doctrines that was getting spread. So this is not a hierarchy where he's saying, come on guys, women's got to be under under Adam because he was created first. No, because then the next verse says this. But women will be saved through childbearing, assuming they continue to live in faith, love, holiness, and modesty. Women will be saved through childbearing. Okay, if we take that literally, it means you want to come to Jesus, have a baby. (laughs) Uh, Yeah. Yeah, Terry over here, I don't want that. Yeah. Yeah. Is that true? Everyone's really scared to answer this. We come to salvation through Jesus Christ, by believing in Jesus Christ. You are not saved for eternity by having a child. Right? Otherwise, I'd say, well, I want to come to Jesus. Okay, we'll have a baby. Right? That is not the case. But yet, how come we'll take the other verse out of context, but we don't take this out of context? Because I think every church I know, no one, I don't know of any church that preaches, okay, if you want to be saved in Jesus Christ, go have a baby. But yet, out of context, but what this is saying is that we, that women, woman was made from man, but guess what? It says here, women will be saved through childbearing. What he's saying is, through, woman came from man, but where did Jesus come from? Jesus came from woman. By her giving birth to Jesus Christ, it went full circle. God redeemed. God brought it all the way around, okay? So it's time for all of us to take our place in the kingdom of God. Young, old, men, women. Look at this. Don't ever let man disqualify who God has called and anointed. God calls you qualified, and you live to please an audience of one. If I cared what man said about me, I would have stepped down 15 years ago. You can't care about what man says. You've got to care about what God says. When I stand before God someday and he judges me on my obedience, he's not going to care. He's not going to ask me, well, did you please everybody? 
He's going to say, did you do what I asked you to do? He's the only one I need to answer to. Now, I heard a great, R.W. Schambach is a great preacher who's now with Jesus. I wish I could imitate him. But he says it like, he says, if woman can carry the living word of God for nine months, why can't she carry the written word of God and preach? (laughs) Thank you. He was a fiery preacher. But God redeemed. Women have always been instrumental in what God has planned. He has something for each and every one of us. I don't want us holding back our women. I don't want us holding back our men. I don't want to hold us back our young people. All of us have to step into what God has got. Now, Galatians 3.28, I want to go back to this for just a second. And we no longer see each other in our former state, Jew or non-Jew, rich or poor, male or female, because we're all one through our union with Jesus Christ with no distinction between us. Now, these are folders, right? And, and Faye, if you came to me and said, can you give me a folder? I need a folder. I've got all this paperwork. Can you give me a folder? Does it matter which one I give her? Why? Because they're the same. There's no distinction between them. You see, there's no distinction between men and women when it comes to ministry and to what God wants to do. You may not be able, put it this way, if you need a healing, you need a word from God, does it matter if it comes from this one or this one? I don't know, but I just, you know, as Ralph says, he says, I don't care how God brings it, I just, if he brings it through a dog in a brown paper bag, I don't care. But sometimes we get offended by who brings God's answer. We had a man, we had a couple in our church. They were in our church for about a year, and he just did not agree with women in ministry. Do you know it was my ministry to him and my praying with him that got him set free from a 30-year smoking addiction? All these things in his life. But he just could not reconcile that God could use a woman to minister to him. But what does it matter? I want miracles to flow through our men, through our women, through our old, through our young through every ethnicity, through every racial and social status. I don't care. I just want us to rise up and be what God's called us to be. Amen. Look, I want us, I want us, let's stand to your feet. I want to make a declaration over us. I'd like you to speak it out with us, with me, okay? Speak it. Pour out your spirit on us. Speak it with me. And cause us, your sons and daughters, to prophesy. And us, as young men and women, to see visions. And us, as old men and women, to experience dreams from God. Holy Spirit, come upon us all, your servants, men and women alike. And may we prophesy. I want every single one of you to live out your fullest potential in whatever God has called you to. Whether it be business, finance, ministry, whatever God's calling you to, he can equip you for it, right? No, there is no barrier. I don't care what your past looks like. I don't care what your situation looks like, your education. God wants to use you. But the first step is to accept Jesus into your life. You know, he makes all the difference. You can know about God. You can do religion. But unless you accept Jesus Christ, you're not going to have the power and you're not going to have that access to God. The Bible says he is the one true way. He is the way, the truth, and the life. No one gets to the Father except through Jesus Christ. Last week we shared how Christmas Eve, a young man in his 20s came to church. A friend brought him. He accepted Jesus. Three days later, died unexpectedly. Praise God, he accepted Jesus and he's in heaven. Right? But eternity lies in this. And so if you're just feeling, man, I just got to take that next step. Maybe it's been on the fence. Maybe you just haven't really realized it's making that decision. We're going to pray a prayer. And I want the rest of us just to pray it. And if you mean that, if you see that, 
uh, if you're feeling it, just we're going to ask him into your life and just pray along with us. So let's, let's close our eyes and just repeat after me. Father, forgive me of my sins. Right now I invite Jesus into my life. Help me to serve you, to live for you. I give myself to you now. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.